Now this afternoon, uh, I, I've already said to you that our wonderful guest speaker today is Dr. Jan McLeod. Now Jan has her PhD in history from the, UK, uh, the Newcastle University, University of Newcastle. Um, this afternoon, Jan is going to share the story of her great uncle, Private Lawrence Nicholas Kennedy, who served as a medical orderly in the Middle East and on the Kokoda track during World War II. Drawing on Private Kennedy's wartime diary and photographs, Jan's presentation highlights the important links between personal, local, national and global history. Now, uh, Jan has published two books. Her um, first book, Shadows on the Track, Australia's Medical War in Papua, 1942 to 1943, was published in 2019. Her most recent book, All the Broken Soldiers, Private Kennedy's War, was released in November 2022. Both books are available this afternoon for $25 each. And uh, some of you might be very interested in purchasing a copy of one of them. So welcome, Jan. Um, how long did you, do I have to talk? For? Do you normally go for an hour or do you? Yep, whatever. Okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> we could be here all night. No, that's no indication because... Um, how can I put this politely? A lot of my um, interested people are older military men, and often before I even start, they're nodding off in the front. God love them. Um, they, sometimes I'll, I'll no, <laughs> but actually when I, I gave a talk over at Adamstown recently and the fellows thanked me at the end of it and congratulated me because no one went to sleep. So <laughs> truly, <laughs> that was my measure of success. But that thank you. That's okay, because I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, so thank you. I assume that you've got some interest in the topic for coming along today. Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of keep things fairly informal, so if you want to jump in at any time or, I mean, I've done really formal presentations before in a conference situation, but sometimes in a group like this, if there's something I'm saying that doesn't make sense or you want me to try and elaborate, I will. Um, but, yeah, as um, we were saying, that it's, the important thing to me was that about that link between personal, local, national, and you people would know all about that being family historians and just how it adds to our understanding of the broader history. So um, I should start by saying I'm not a military historian. Um, so my interest in this is obviously comes from a personal um, interest. Um, and I guess the category that I'm usually slotted into is medical military historian, but I'm obviously not a medical doctor either. So I don't pretend to know anything about all the manoeuvres and the technical aspects of fighting a war. The area I'm looking at is the medical aspects of medical service and the provision of medical care to the soldiers. And obviously with this book, um, the first book was much more formal, based more on the PhD thesis. But this was the story I really wanted to tell because it's the more personal story of my uncle. And um, this was where my passion lies and this is what took me back to study as a mature age student. Um, so I guess if we're looking at, what's the best way to go? Sorry, just, um, yeah. So this is the first part. I'm just looking at the, the connections. And um, this presentation is based on the book. So... I start by looking at the man himself and his background, so the family history aspect to it. Um, so the photo here shows the Kennedy family um, at Yarramalong, on the property at Yarramalong, and these are the graves where Nick and Bill are now buried, and that's the Kennedy family plot at Yarramalong, which is on the central coast. Anyone familiar with that? Yeah. Gorgeous little place. Um and the family was struck by tragedy and it, it's almost represented there in that photo by that physical gap and also the gap in the ages of the, the children um, in that they lost three children within the space of a year um, to what they put down to a typhoid. Uh, typhoid or cholera was a bit iffy which at the time, but um, three young children, um, quite I think a three-year-old, five and 10-year-old. 
Um, and then this letter here is actually referring to a further tragedy that struck in 1933. Okay, so I was just explaining that there was a gap because of the loss of the children in that family photo there. The next photo is the family plot at Yarramalong Cemetery, which is a heritage listed cemetery, actually. Um, only the descendants of the originals apparently can be buried there. So I've got my ticket if I want to go down there. Oh, wow. <laughs> it might be a bit lonely. Okay. So the letter is actually um, in, the, in this photo. This is actually Bill. Um, am I pointing on here? I'm not probably. No. <laughs> this is Bill here. Nick isn't born yet. This is my grandfather, Dennis. But in 1933, Dennis was actually killed. He was fighting a fire um, in the shops in the main wild stretch of shops down there. Um, and so my dad and his two sisters um, and my nan, May, uh, were left without their father and husband. Dad was 20 months old, I think. So I never met the man, obviously, um, who was my grandfather. And this letter, it's just another link in the family history that I found which is basically from my nan's mother telling her that she has to be strong and get on with it for the kids' sake of the kids. Um, so it's probably a bit hard to, to read there and I won't go through it all. But basically talking about how the community is rallying around the family and the local doctors offered his services for free whenever he's in town um, and how loved the kids were and, um, yeah, it's just one of those little family stories and it just helps to sort of paint the picture of this family that seemed to have a lot of hardship in their lives but not unique as we know to people at that time. The other local link that fits in here with my uncle and with this topic is he um, he owned this house in Cleary Street, Hamilton, um, and in later life he actually came to live there. Um, it, it ended up in one, with one of the other relatives and he came to live with them when he was ill. Um, and also uh, Pete and Milson Island, both the brothers worked on Pete and Milson Island. Uh, Nick was a medical orderly or nurse, training to be a nurse there. Um, it was a hospital, well, they called it a mental hospital in those days. And my uncle Bill worked as a laundryman there. Um, so that little program on there in the middle is from when they came home. I mean, it's still 1947, but they were doing a welcome home. There were an awful lot of um, men from the island who actually volunteered, and most of them did work in the medical unit. The reason I've got the Stockton War Memorial there is um, I talk about an incident later on, um, and two of the men who were there and who were killed in this incident, their names, uh, one of the names is on the um, Stockton War Memorial. There was a couple of local men affected either they were members of the second force or they were also impacted by this event that occurred um, so again that local that local um, information so um, the story of my uncle and my interest in it started when I found all these sorts of artifacts um, the first up the top there is his armband with still got the blood stains on it um, and I often think I should bring these things along but I just think they're so precious I'm so worried that something will happen to them but um it's just something about having that tangible evidence and really it was this little diary um that set me off with that tiny writing um my dad uh didn't know much about my uncle's experience he but he always looked up to my uncles because they basically took the place of his father and um he just knew he did something in the war and he thought he was a stretcher bearer so he gave me all this stuff. It was all, I'll show you the next picture. Um, that's just some of his postcards that he sent back from the Middle East. It was also there. But this is what started my journey to university. <laughs> it's an ice cream container. And when my dad found out, I, we weren't a family of academics, I should say. We were pretty much working class, grew up in Shortland up the road and um, didn't really know what the university did. <laughs> um, so I said to Dad when, in 1989, I wanted to go and do the Open Foundation course and uh, as what was then a mature age student but now looks really young. And um, Dad went in and shuffled around. He was an old sailor, so he never missed his words. And he came out and said, well, you better have this then if you're going to go and study. And he plonked it on the table and the diary was in it, the um, armband was in it, my uncle's medals were in it, <laughs> the postcards. There was just so much treasure in this 
um, little ice cream container and I was off. That, that, that's how it was labelled. I've still got it at home, medals, Nick. Um, so I thought I have to know more. So I went and did the university uh, Open Foundation, did the Bachelor of Arts degree and was taught by brilliant people like John Ramsden mm -hmm. and encouraged my love of learning. And then I went back many years. I did teaching for a few years, survived that. And uh, went back again because in the back of my head, I've got to tell this story. So did honours and then did the PhD and that's how we ended up here. Um, so I, to look at it in the local um, and broader uh, sphere, I guess, just an idea of some of the, um, the statistics. Uh, obviously, overwhelmingly, the enlistments were in the army. Um, and, of course, they suffered the proportionate number of higher deaths as well. Um, then the RAF and then the, the Navy. As I said, my dad was in the Navy and he always thought the Army got too much of the glory, you see. But when you look at the numbers, the numbers, especially Second World War, they were just so high for the, for the enlistments. So I also went looking in at the local enlistments um, as well, which I think also makes it more interesting on a personal level. Um, do I have a lamp in there? I don't know if I do. But um, just to get an idea of, this is from their attestation forms where they just put in their place of birth, their address. Um, so it's pretty broad. It was through the DVA, which I'm sure you're all familiar with if you've looked into all this, the nominal roles, and just gives you another idea of how, how the numbers stacked up. Maybe you're familiar with that too as local historians, the King Street Drill Hall um, down the bottom end there um, near Birdwood Park. Um, that, so that's apparently the oldest remaining army depot in town and it was later, excuse me, it was um, because all the army depot sites around town were consolidated when the army base at Adamstown was built. So um, the Statement of Heritage yeah, states that the hall was built in 1910 for use as an army training facility. Uh, the original trained the local men um, and during the period of universal training and served as recruiting and induction centre during both world wars. And there were notes there that many Newcastle soldiers who served in overseas theatres of war started their military careers at this depot. So this is also where the volunteers underwent their medical examinations and it was still used as a training depot until the early 1990s. So beyond the local links on that level, <clears throat> In terms of the more specific link, the unit that my uncles were in was the second, fourth Australian field ambulance. And so there were 28 personnel that I found just through the DVA site that actually had links to the unit and Newcastle and the Hunter. And that was just by, again, by looking at their records and looking at local suburbs where they enlisted from. And I think what's interesting to think about is their occupations. They were clerks, they were truck drivers, waiters, steel workers. There weren't a lot of um, nurses um, because the role of the field ambulance was broader than just nursing in that you had transport guys associated. You had um, the guys who went along and could help construct the, the dressing stations. There were a few different roles, the stretcher bearers, but there were also mental nurses, as they were called because also there were no male nurses in those days unless it was in the mental and nursing because it was the idea of the strength that was needed in that field, which was interesting in that you had a bit of discrimination in some ways in that a lot of the army guys saw the men who were in the medical units as not real soldiers because they weren't at the front and they weren't fighting. They were doing what was seen as a woman's role. Then on the other side, you had the female nurses who resented these guys, especially when it was training time and they had to go into the hospitals and the nurses had to help train them. They resented having these men in their hospitals. It was very, very territorial. So, yeah, a lot of them in the early days were referred to as linseed lances, is what they used to call them on the battlefield, but they usually were quite glad to see them. And there was an interesting show, I don't know if anyone saw it, was it Dateline or Foreign Correspondent last week about the medical units in the Ukraine at the moment. If you can see it on, on iView, it was fascinating and amazing how much has changed but how much has stayed the same. I mean, the technology still is fabulous, but in terms of the reality of actually 
mending these bodies from the from the battlefield. Uh, so that was just the photos of some of the local guys. And this is just another example. You're familiar with these, I'm assuming, which is just the paperwork that comes along with their files, their personnel files. So, um, yeah, I just, I just um, picked this man because uh, I did a talk out at Lake Macquarie, uh, the new library out at Sugar Valley, actually. And um, we looked at Alexander Locking because he was from West Wall's End. He was single. He just turned 23 when he enlisted in 1941. He worked as a fuel man on the ra railways. Um, by the time he was demobilised, demobbed at the end of the war, he'd served for 1,620 days. Almost a 1,000 of those days were spent overseas in the Middle East, New Guinea and Borneo. And by the time he came back, he'd been married and he had a child and he moved into 86 Brown Street in West Falls End. So still kept it local. But, um, it's, again, that insight, especially when there's a photograph, um, when you can identify with these men. So that's just my little representation. Excuse me. I'm just going to grab a drink. Um, that's from the Pillars um at the memorial in on the Kokoda track in Sarava. And just again, just emphasizing that connection between the histories. So this second part is the more personal side of the story. Feel free to interrupt me if anyone has any questions or whatever from the first part there. So I always loved this photograph. It was on the back Nick had written Cafe in Jerusalem, 1941. And that's Nick there with the moustache with the lady standing behind him. Um, I know. And I want to know who she was and whatever happened to her, but can't can't find any. Yeah. So when I was doing the research, it was important to me to um, which I did more in this book than I could do in the in the previous, was to rely on Nick's words and Nick's photographs. So all the photographs, pretty much all, I think there might be a couple here, um, are from his diary because the other treasure we had, which my cousin, who is also a family historian, gave me was his wartime photo album. My dad had had a lot of loose photographs and I hate telling you this story, you'll be as heartbroken as me, but when he decided to have a clean out one day of the garage, what did he do? He threw them out. And he's never forgiven himself. Well, he's gone now, but he never forgave himself. But my cousin came to the rescue because he had had them all in the photo album that Nick had bought in the Middle East. So that's where that, that photograph comes from. Um, and, yeah, the words in the book, in this Broken Soldiers book, each chapter starts with the quote from Nick's diary and takes us through chronologically. So from when he goes, when he enlists, when he goes through the camps and... Um, when to go to the Middle East, they come back, retrain and go up to Papua New Guinea. So that's the, the way this, the book has functioned. So that's the little diary. Um, can, it was purchased in the Middle East and the, the tiny little writing. I transcribed that for Dad's birthday many, many decades ago. Um, that's what opened up the story to me. So Nick's there with the, it looks like the very worried brow. Whenever he put that hat on, it seemed to just push these lines down, and that's his brother, Bill. So Bill was the older brother, um, Nick. Uh, they both enlisted together um, in May 1942. So Nick, I think, was 23 at the time, and Bill was about 30, 31. And Bill was married with a child. Uh, Nick was single and, and living and working down at Pete Island. So... Um, just to give you an idea, when people hear the field ambulance, they often think of a vehicle, not really familiar with what it is, but it was part of the medical services. So that's my attempt at trying to make a basic representation of the Australian Army. So in the red there, the service corps is one branch, the arms corps is the other, and then part of the service corps is the medical services. And if you follow that down, you've got the medical corps, and then part of the medical corps is the field ambulance. So you also have other facilities, the casualty clearing stations, hospitalary, hospitals, sanitary, bacteriology, pathology, and convalescent depots. So the field ambulance is where our focus is. And then within the field ambulance, the structure, they support the brigades 
and at this time there were the three brigades, they're very rough figures, that formed the division. The second fourth field ambulance was part of the seventh division. And then within the field ambulance of a couple of hundred men, um, there was a headquarters company, which is what Bill and Nick were in. And the MDS was the main dressing station, so they were responsible for manning and working there. Then A Company and B Company, which was advanced dressing station and stretcher bearers primarily. Just a bit of an explanation at the bottom there about the structure in terms of rank. Importantly, 10 of the 12 officers were medical officers. They were doctors who volunteered to join these units. And you had your quartermaster as well and the service corps. Um, and each field ambulance establishment included one officer and 56 other ranks of the service corps. But what's important to know is um, rarely were they ever at full strength and never, never when they were in Papua were they ever at full strength. Um, so you can see they were behind the eight ball from the start. Uh, so first step was their training. So they camped in Engelburn and Bathurst. So Nick's at the rear there on the back step, second from the left there, sitting lower down. And that's Nick here with his lovely army haircut and his mate. Um, so the, the training focused as much on the physical as, as the training for all the army units did. They still did all the, the marches with their full pack. They still underwent rigorous um, training, but they also did medical training, theory and practical. Um, and again, you had that range of men. So someone like Nick, who was working in a, a medical field, at least had a background with some knowledge of it. But remembering you had guys from all walks of life. So to some of them, it was pretty much like first aid training primarily. Um, you know, how to stop the bleeding, how to apply a bandage. And then later on, as they got on, it was about things like diagnosis of malaria. They had the men doing some of the slides and that sort of thing to try and, you know, learn a bit more about the pathology. One of the big things that they did as part of their training was they sent them from the camp over the Blue Mountains to Bathurst in the middle of winter on a march. <laughs> um, some of them went in vehicles, um, but some of them just marched the whole way. Uh, one of the, the wives of one of the men who was in the unit wrote me a letter many years ago, and she said that that's what the husband always remembered. He said he would never march again <laughs> after he got out of the army and just how much his feet ached all the way through. Um, so, and she said he never did march again. So uh, they sailed out of Fremantle in October 1940 and they went. were heading to the Middle East uh, via Bombay, India. Um, in November, they stayed at Deal Ali Camp there. So these were some of the photos. This bottom one is taken on board the Aquitania. That's Nick on the far, that drop-shouldered lean there. Um, and then the others, that's Bill on the uh, on the wheel there and Nick's in the back of the horse-drawn carriage and then with the local people there. And just talking about the um, the differences and the different cultures and imagining what they must have seen and heard and smelt after living these tiny lives in small little communities in those days. So while they were on board the Aquitania, they were responsible for the medical care on board. They treated over 600 casualties, which ranged from infections to fractures, cuts, dental, boils. And interestingly, they had two gunshot wounds in brackets secondary treatment. I don't know what happened on board the ship that they had two gunshot wounds. But they talk about Bombay being a unique experience um, and they explored the sites, including the bars and the brothels, despite the warnings. That led to a whole other series of casualties that they had to treat. <laughs> um, and that was interesting finding out about that because um, in Nick's diary, he just makes this vague reference to um, going to Grant Road, I think it's called. And I'm thinking, what do I specifically mention that? And when I go looking, Grant Road was one area they told them not to go to because of the, um, shall we say, less than salubrious surroundings perhaps. Um, but he did, so <laughs> not surprising, I guess. Um, and so when they get to the Middle East, uh, they reach Port Suez. So this is some photos of them in the Middle East. Again, it's all from 
from Nick's diary, Nick's photo album, sorry. So he talks about reaching Port Suez in November 1940. Um, he talks about the times, the clocks being behind, what it was like sailing up the Suez Canal, describes it all, receiving his first mail from Australia in December 1940, visiting Tel Aviv, having Christmas Day in camp, um, then Boxing Day, they had derby races. Most of the officers proved to be good jockeys. He talks about that. And then he talks about 1941 greets Palestine, a beautiful sunny day, like a sunny day in midwinter in Australia. Thursday on parade with 1941 glaring at us. 2nd of January, and we were granted leave to visit the holy city, Jerusalem. Stayed at the Hotel Fast, the Australia's Soldiers Club. The next morning, we left the club at 8.30 and visited the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Consists of a wonderful old church built over the spot where Christ was crucified, the anointing stone and the tomb where he rose from the dead. Curtains draped with gold and silver were to be seen, lamps of gold worth thousands of pounds. He goes on to talk about the jewellery and the statue. And what's interesting to me is he, he's a Catholic and he takes this as a literal representation. The Bible is literal literally interpreted by him. He talks about in Bethlehem we viewed the spot where Christ was born and the manger he was laid in. Viewed the spot where the shepherds watched their flocks by night and the three angels appeared as the star directed them to where Christ was born. And he talks about visiting the holy mosque and how the pillars consisted of solid marble. So it's just when you read it you can sort of just feel the wonder that he experienced as he was writing it all. But the reality of camp life was a little a little harsher. So they were very much diggers, digging their trenches. This is the bottom one is them getting their news from home with the local newspapers and just the, the men that were in their, in their tent. So his first experience of, of war is when he goes into Egypt as a field ambulance man or I think, what does he say, first aid man, he says, on a convoy of motor trucks. Um, so most of the, the work he does there is um is there from 1940 to early 42 they do more training and they serve in palestine egypt syria and lebanon um most of their time is spent in syria and from the point of view of the medical units the key points are that basically it was infrastructure here you had towns you had railways airfields roads you had a relatively reliable transport system for supply and evacuation um, and most of their time was spent in Syria after the occupation, after the Australian victory, the, the Allied victory. On a personal level, Nick's health took a bit of a beating as well. He spent whole, uh, weeks in and out of medical facilities with dysentery, mumps, and he had his appendix removed in Syria. So um, they, after they're told this is more of their time in the, in the Western Desert and Syria, so there's all these excerpts in the book. Um, about what he experienced there. And then this is, I just love these photos. They're just mm -hmm. fabulous photos, aren't they? Yeah. Um, the book probably doesn't do them justice, but I scanned them in high resolution thanks to my friend Anne Hardy at the Newcastle Uni Library, and they've just come up a treat. And you can see things in them that you just couldn't see in those tiny little photos that you had in those albums at the time. But up in this top one, I don't know if you can make them out, Nick's in the middle there. That's the Temple of Baalbek. Um, and they've climbed up to the top. Just, I just think it's a classic Australian thing to do. Um, having a snow fight and then these pictures of the the um, everyday life in Syria. And he, that this one at the end is entitled Syrian ba or Arab Barber, that one's called. So um, quite evocative. So... I don't know if I've got time. I'm not sure how much time to take to read to some of these excerpts. But um, yeah, it talks about, just describes his life in Syria and the times that he's there. And then um, talks about Beirut. Yeah, that's right. He says, after leaving Beirut, we began to climb the mountainous ranges. Beirut from this height looked like a miniature cemetery. Camp 10 miles out of Damascus on the first night and it was as cold as hell. Next day we continued our journey into Damascus, which is recognised as the oldest inhabited city in the world. And he talks again about visiting all these sites, biblical sites. Talks about the walls built by the Romans in the early centuries and the French Revolution of 1924 in Damascus. 
And the following day, we continued our journey to Baalbek. Here we viewed the ruins of the temple. This ancient temple built by the Romans took 400 years to complete and was started in the first century. Some of the pillars weigh 800 tons. We camped here the night and continued our journey back to Tripoli the next day. So again, that's just the start of the chapter and then I'll just talk about the incident that unfolded in the war to sort of give that some context. So after all that time in um, the Middle East, 16th of February, 1942, um, they're at sea. They, they're told that they, I didn't go into all this here, but perhaps possibly aware of the drama about bringing back the 7th Division to Australia and how Churchill wanted to send them to Burma and Curtin stood up to him. Well, the men had no idea where they were going. They didn't know where they were going. <clears throat> and um, they were at sea and, and a couple of the ships were sort of going up and back across the equator and were stopping here and stopping there and they were speculating on where they were going. So it wasn't until the 16th of February that they learnt at the fall of Singapore and that they knew they were coming home. Excuse me. Um, so that photo is taken in Colombo in um, what was then Ceylon. Uh, so they returned to Australia. In a, The journey takes quite a while and they begin training, moving around from South Australia to New South Wales to Queensland. And even then they're not sure where they're going. They're just being sent to these different training camps. Um, <coughs> what's interesting is Nick's diary gives so much detail when he's overseas about lots of um, things that he sees, what he encounters. When he comes home, there's hardly anything. He, and yet he had leave and he goes and sees his family and he just talks about how much leave they're granted, but he doesn't actually talk of what it was like to see the family. And I was lucky enough to find um, at the War Memorial the diary of another field ambulance man, and it's the same thing. He talks about, describes what the voyage home was like, about the dolphins leaping, about what it was like to see Perth and see Australia again. And then he just says something like, because I think he was from South Australia, this guy, so they go to South Australia first. He has a couple of days leave, caught up with a few of the family and then back in camp. And that's it. He doesn't tell you what happened, what it was like, you know, which is very interesting. But we know where he's heading. Um which brings us to the next stage of it, of the um, the journey of Nick and Bill and the rest of the second fourth. And I think what um, what brings it home to you is when he talks about, um, sorry, I've got all these things marked, but what's happened over the years is I've got so many things marked, can't find the right one. He um, In part of the diary, he speculates um, at the start, at what, what it is is New Year's 1942. And he basically says, none of us want to come back here. We don't want to stay any longer in the Middle East. We're looking forward to going back home. And surely 1942 will be a better year. Well, as we know, it was far from that. It was far from that. So they come back and they up at, uh, in Caboolture and then they sail from Brisbane to Townsville and then... They steam into Port Moresby aboard the Jason Lee at 4 p.m. on the 17th of September 1942. I won't go into all the details about the Papillon campaign. I'm assuming you're familiar with the basics of the Japanese landing in the north and the aim to take Port Moresby. It was thwarted originally. It was going to be from the sea and from the south. They end up in the north and then they're coming back towards Port Moresby along the Kokoda track. So by the time Nick goes up there, the Australian um, the Australians had attempted to push the Japanese back unsuccessfully. And so Nick goes up as part of the push, the organised offensive to reinforce the militiamen that were up there. So unfortunately, the uh, 25th Brigade, which the 2nd Force was in support of, went into battle before they arrived. They had had, they had no immediate medical care. But even the guys, the militia guys, had no medical care when they went into battle initially. It was only that there was a character called Doc Vernon. Has anyone heard of Doc Vernon? From the First World War, who was almost blind and completely deaf and lived in the mountains and cared for the New Guinea local people um, even before the war. 
So when he when all this broke out, he knew these guys would be going up without any medical care. So he said, no, I'm going to go and help. So he came down to do what he could and they sent, I think, between six and nine um, Australian medical guys from the field ambulance that had been stationed around Port Moresby, but that's all that were the medical support for that initial stage. So when Nick gets there, they're part of the offensive that's um, going back up back up the uh, Kokoda track. So they're loaded onto trucks. They're taken up to Murray Barracks, about eight miles from Moresby, and they sleep under the stars that night. Then they move up in a motor convoy to the front line, march to Ilolo, and all through this area was rubber plantations and jungle country. And then they cut their way through some of the scrub and find good water. So before I just look at the hit Nick's um, journey, just considering some of the health and medical challenges that they had to deal with, they really didn't know what was waiting for them, but they knew it wasn't going to be easy. But I just summarised some of the main challenges they had were issues of leadership in terms of um, we was, and which ties in with preparation, planning and priority. We were so underprepared. We didn't know what to expect. We didn't really think the Japanese would attack from the north and get over the, the ranges. Um, so the leadership was pretty much caught short. Um, the terrain and environment and the lack of infrastructure, far different to the Middle East. Communication was all affected by that. Supply and transport issues. There were planes, but there weren't many. Then there weren't many pilots either because a lot of them had gone to Britain as well. The Americans weren't really in it at this stage. They, they come in, into Papua later on. So how to treat these people in a jungle environment. And one of the key issues they faced was this idea of evacuation. Um, so it was a non-traditional chain of evacuation because you would normally have, um, I don't know if I put that in here. No, you'd normally have advanced, you have a regimental medical officer who treats them on the battlefield. You have an advanced dressing station, does a bit of basic first aid and patching them up. Then you take them back to the main dressing station where much more intensive care is given, back to a casualty clearing station, back to a base hospital. Well, we didn't have the base hospital up there yet. We were still building that. <laughs> We didn't have casualty clearing stations. They said they were going to be too cumbersome to move through. So basically the main dressing station that Nick and Bill were working at was it and the advanced dressing stations, they worked the two of those. So um, this idea of a non-traditional chain of evacuation, it was all done on ad hoc and on the run pretty much trying to make it how we're going to work this out because we couldn't evacuate the casualties um, so, of course, malaria was one of the main issues. 90% uh, of the Australian soldiers contracted malaria within a month of being stationed at the beachheads, which was the beaches of the northern part, Gona, Buna and San Ananda. Uh, 11,500 were admitted to medical facilities suffering from malaria between October and April. Over 14,000 suffered from tropical diseases in just one quarter. And there was a ratio of 4.7 to 1 of tropical diseases to battle casualties. So you had almost 30,000 Australian casualties from tropic, suffering from tropical diseases during the Papuan campaign, which is pretty astounding when you consider there was 6,000 odd battle casualties. So for most of this day, or for all of this stage, the only medical on the track was the second, fourth and the second, sixth field ambulances. And then they would occasionally get reinforcements from 2nd, 9th and a couple of militia um, units. 2nd, 9th hospital was established and up and running by about October. Uh, so malaria um, affected the soldiers but also affected the men of the, the medical units themselves. Um, the push was on to get to the north. Um, so that, again, the ad hoc policy through the battle activities had to clear the medical posts. Surgical teams became more vital. Normally you'd put the, the casualty back towards the surgery. What they started doing was bringing the surgery and the surgeons forward to the casualties to save some of that time. They developed mobile operating units that would go forward to do these urgent operations and then they would evacuate the casualties back. So it was a pivotal time when this medical... Um, plan that we had in place based purely on the British way of doing things 
and based on an environment which had infrastructure. It just was completely upended. So these are some of the photos from the Nick's um, photo album. That first one is the men having a dip in a stream before they head off on the track. Down the bottom, which is hard to see, but it gives you an idea of the sort of shelters that they had to build for themselves. And this one over here is one of his um, comrades on what was known as the Golden Staircase. Um, they had to go up and over all of the Alan Stanley Ranges. They had to do it. The, the story generally of the medical unit in Papua is centred around the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels, as we somewhat patronisingly call the local people. But I think what's been lost is they, they were vital and they were the carriers, but the Australians were the guys who provided the medical care and they also had to do a lot of the carrying. And there were places that the Papuan people wouldn't go. There were times when they abandoned the um, field ambulance. They were treated appallingly often, but Doc Vernon actually came in and really coordinated the care of the, of the bearers because the primary primarily primary function of the carriers was actually to carry supplies to the front. They were never intended to bring the patients back. That was just a secondary action born of necessity because we had nothing else in place, but that was not their, their pri primary goal or their priority. Um, so the situation was pretty dire. Um, there's a small series of photos from Nick's photo album. There's actually graves behind these guys here, um, Eddie Fogey in the jungle. They talk about the darkness, talks about the terrain. I mean, that's what really Nick opens up about. And there's so much more in his writing um, about the time in Papua. And he, he shows much more of himself as well. He doesn't just describe. As it goes on, he gets to a place called Myola and he just, it seems to just be there that really makes a, a marker for him in terms of the devastation and just how long this is going on for. So he says, we arrive at Myola at 3 p.m. This is an open space about, about a mile long, half, half as wide. A lot of it's marshy swamp country. We, where we set up our main dressing station, there's a good running stream. We're 7,000 feet up now and the nights are extremely cold. We're collecting a lot of wounded here. Our surgeon, Captain Leslie, is working 18 hours a day at times. The operating theatre consists of a tent fly pitched close to the running stream. The operating table consists of a wooden bench built out of poles. Some of the most complicated operations are being performed here, abdominal wounds, amputations of arms and legs, and severe head injuries. The planes come every morning and drop the usual supplies. Tents and blankets are dropped, about the only thing that we get in one piece during these droppings. We're more than busy attending to our wounded here, 14, sometimes 18 hours without a break. But no one cares. These chaps are deserving of the best we can give them and are more than grateful for the assistance rendered them. Some of these wounds are terrific. One wonders at times how the human body can live being mutilated like some of these poor fellows. But one cannot express his feeling towards them. We've got to try and keep them cheerful, but this is a hard job under these conditions. The tents are not the best, they leak somewhat, so we have to do the best we can to keep them dry with ground sheets and bags. It rains here just as bad as everywhere else along the track. Some medical gear, gear is dropped by parachute from the plane, such as ether, morphine and anti-tetanus serum. We don't stint the use of morphine. A lot have two, maybe three injections to ease their pain. A quarter of a gram of morphine about every four or five hours. So just that writing opened up so much in terms of understanding what they went through. And when I went looking, there were um, euthanasia actually happened on the track. Um, they were, there were times when the men were given those extra do doses of morphine. Um, men who were, there's a story in the first book of men who were left, they had gaping chest wounds, or sucking chest wounds as they called them, massive abdominal wounds. The doctors made the decision that they weren't going to make it. So they loaded them up with morphine and they left them for the night because they had to evacuate back. They went back and checked on them the next day and two of them had passed in the night, but one was still alive. 
So they tried to bundle him out. The, the story goes that he said to him, "You won't let me die here, good doc." Words to that effect. And so they tried to get him to the road head, but um, he didn't make it. And while I was researching that, I actually spoke to the daughter of the doctor who made that decision. She is actually Professor Magari. I always say her name wrong. She's from South Australia. And I told her I was doing this book, the first book, and I wrote to her to tell her I was putting this incident in because I didn't want it to cause her any distress. And I, I didn't tell her all the details, but I just said, was she aware of this? And she wrote back to me and she said, yeah, she was, but she was always under the impression that they all survived. She said her dad did talk about it. And they're actually on the War Memorial site, there are recordings, and someone has interviewed um, Dr Magari and he talks about the incident there. But the decisions these guys had to make, um, and, what they, and the amazing thing is really how many survived. I mean, what they did with so little, because when Nick's talking about drop, getting airdrops of medical um, supplies, they did drop them, but often they just dropped them in glass bottles. Mm. They did. Mm. I read it a couple of times. What? Later they tried to package them, but they would often push them out of the plane with parachutes and they not only would they land behind where they needed to be or in the jungle or couldn't be retrieved or the bandages would go in the mud, but, yeah, the bottles would just smash, ether and morphine. and Or they'd send them the dry serum without the sterilised water to mix up the... And this is where I have an issue. I'll just digress for a moment, if I may. Um, the argument is it's all very well with the benefit of hindsight to judge these people too harshly. They did what they could do, and I believe that's true. But I do also think that by a certain stage of the campaign, when the decision, a definite decision had been made not to bring our Australian guys back to Australia for treatment despite the building of repatriation hospitals all around the country but to treat them in Papua, that we owed them something better than what we gave them. And when we knew we didn't have the planes or the pilots to get them out, we were relying on backloading the, the um, locals, we needed to try something. And in my view, I'm, again, my personal opinion, the guy who was in charge of the medical at that time was very close friends with Blamey. And I don't know that he advocated as hard as he should have or could have. Um, there were a lot of, there was, seemed to be a lot of reporting back things aren't as bad as they seem. And there was a quote by one of the doctors who went, or one of the medical guys who went up to have a look and he said, look, they're not on a bed of roses. I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like, there's no bed of roses, but they're doing okay. Now, the guys at Myola that Nick describes had to stay there for months because there was no way to get them out. So what happened, the effect of that was the second six field ambulance was supposed to move forward to the beachheads with Nick's unit, the second, fourth but they couldn't go because they had to stay at Myola to care for these patients. Most of those patients had to walk their way back over the mountains to care in Port Moresby. And the ones who couldn't, they had to, they had to stay there until December when the last of them could be brought out. So, yes, it was a really, really challenging environment, but I just think, you know, what could have been perhaps... So some of these are, are photos, again, which are very unusual to find. Nick had a few of them in his album. And how I don't know how he came about getting these photos, whether they were taken by someone else. There are photos on the War Memorial site by um, Hobson, who was the commanding officer. He took quite a series of photographs, but these just offer another insight into what the conditions were like on the track and what the conditions were like at the dressing stations. This tall man here on the end um, was known as Tiny as is the way of the Australian nicknames. And he was from um, oh, Bangalore on the north coast and he was uh, described as a six-foot-tall bullocky. He used to sling his size 13 boots over his shoulder on the walk and walk barefoot when he had to march. Because, again, I was lucky enough to talk to two men from the second four field ambulance before they passed away in the 1990s. That's how long this story has been in my head. And they told me some great tales and, and one of them had actually written a document about it. So it's been really useful. I just want to finish up this with the last section, which is just focusing on the beachheads, which is around that inside that circle area there, whether you're familiar with Gona, Buna, San Ananda. 
far more of the um the fighting, the wounded and the deaths and the malaria happened there than anywhere else on the track. By this stage, the Americans had come in, but they were flown in. Um, they didn't hadn't done the track like all of our guys had done and then fight. And same as our medical men. So Nick and Bill were up there giving the medical care for uh, this campaign, which I'll just take it back. There was a bit of speculation about whether this was even necessary. There was the idea we should just let the Japanese, as they say, wither on the vine. But MacArthur, who you're probably familiar with, men have not a small ego, um, he wanted to eliminate them completely from, from the island, from Papua, and he basically said whatever it takes. Um, the quote was regardless of losses. The reality of that was pretty tragic. And again, I'm, I'm astounded we didn't lose more. The Americans lost thousands there. It was just a dirty, marshy, malarial infested area. And of course, the Japanese were tenacious and they were as exhausted and sick as we were, but they kept on fighting. So what happened was there was a section called Saputa. I don't know if you can see it just at the end of the track there, that dotted line, Saputa, within the middle of the circle. So that's the area I'm just looking at now. That's as far north as the second fourth field ambulance got to. So they got there in in sorry in November, about the 21st of November, and they were getting ready for this big push that MacArthur had planned, and they were really close to the fighting. And there was fear that something terrible was going to happen. So it did. And what happened was actually documented on a piece of paper that was a mystery to me. It was in that same um, ice cream container. Nick had this map folded up. And it is quite traumatic, I'll tell you before, if you can read any of that writing. The um, It gives a, on the 27th of November, the Japanese bombed and strafed the field ambulance. The seventh, importantly, the seventh division headquarters was right next to the medical unit. It was regarded as a war crime by the Australians. It was inquired, there was a big inquiry held into it. And it went to the Webb inquiry and Justice Webb did not put it forward for consideration as a war crime at the International War Crimes tribunal hearings he didn't do that because he said because of the proximity of the seventh division headquarters to the medical site you couldn't guarantee that they weren't the main target and basically the medical was collateral damage so the argument was that the medical site had been marked with the proper red cross markings of the red cross on the white flag that it was clear to all that it was a medical site i go into the arguments in the books but Basically, there were weapons brought onto the site the day before, people thinking they were doing the right thing because they knew how exposed this medical site was and they thought it might come under attack. By doing that, they voided the Geneva Convention. So the argument was it was a legitimate target of war. So the Americans were also hit. They had a medical base which had the incorrect markings on it and it was hit. So that was the basis of this um, terrible incident that I always wondered about. And um, that's the map that Nick drew, which indicates the original cemetery where his mates were buried and indicates the um, terrible injuries that were suffered by them. Um, I'll just read you the little excerpt and then I know it's a, I know it's a traumatic thing to finish on and all, but... It's just the realities, unfortunately. He talks about this 27th of November being a black day for the 2nd, 4th, um, and then he's got this next part that's on the screen there. We come under heavy machine gun fire, aerial bombardment. 36 are killed and 70 wounded. The officer commanding our company is killed, Major Vickery, also Major McDonald. There's not much left here, dead, mangled bodies, blood guts and mud. This is a day none of the 2nd, 4th will forget, and some great boys have paid the supreme sacrifice here. Bill buries most of our dead. It's midnight before the last of the dead is covered in. We've moved to a new position as we expect another blue that night. The moon makes everything as light as day. 
We wonder will NIP, using the language of the time, send some planes over to drop some more bundles of death and destruction. Kit Gledhill and I toss down on our ground sheets. He thinks it's a good idea if we take it turn about for a sleep, but he's soon snoring and I follow suit. So, um, yeah, tragic circumstances, but researching that opened up so much. Um, when they were publishing that first book, the Army queried <laughs> uh, about, I make an argument that the... Um, the siding of the 7th Division headquarters so near to it made them sitting ducks and the inference is it was a deliberate um, move because they perhaps would then benefit from the protection afforded a medical establishment, which I have to say was my old dad's first thought. That would be bloody right, he said, when I told him my theory. <laughs> and the army came back to me and said, well, if you're going to say that, you better show some evidence that, that they were there you know, after the medical, and I found it. I found it that, that the second floor field ambulance had set a little group of about a dozen medical personnel there at Saputa to set up that medical station before the um, AIF arrived with the division headquarters. So that was that was a major thing to me. So they let me put it all in. They said, you backed it up with evidence. So. I was going to put it in anyway. But. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they were happy. They were happy, basically. But I mean, it just there was so much nuance in that when you look at war crimes and you say, okay, well, yes, you look at that on the face of that was a war crime. It was clearly marked. It was a medical establishment. They had the flag out, and then you find all these stories. You find all this other. So while I've talked about all those details in the first book, in the second book, what I do is I do mention the circumstances, but I actually talk about the lives of the men from the second floor who were killed in that attack. So I just wanted to flesh them out a bit. Um, and so in light of them just finding those graves by the side of the Kokoda track recently, um, on this map you might notice between those two tracks, Nick shows some AIF soldiers buried there and another group of AIF soldiers buried there. And then he's got this cemetery here. So after all the fighting, they came and they they disinterred people and reinterred them from the cemeteries along the track and from Saputa. There was another formal cemetery made at Saputa and then eventually they went to Bamana, big cemetery now. But I, in my mind, I wonder if they they got all of them, you know. I had written to the recovery, to the Army um, Graves Recovery Section and this was years ago though. And um, basically the idea was that they didn't tell me this, but other people had said the Saputa, the river that went through there, um, the Garua River, had changed course since then. And so a lot of that area would have actually been under, yeah, underwater. But um, Bill and Nick, or oh, Bill gave evidence at the um, at the uh, inquest into the, whether it was a war crime. Um, and so I got all the testimonies of the guys and some some say about how close the army um, head, headquarters were some say oh no it was a bit further away and yeah just all that nuance that comes out shows you it's not all cut and dried uh, so I'm sorry to leave you with that but and again this photo makes my heart ache but that's the man that I'm writing about and that photo of Nick that's him in his young days heading off to the war on the end with that same drop shoulder and that's him it's his last Anzac day. He, I went and saw him, me and my dad. I was in Lingard Hospital in 1976. The medal up the top, he was awarded the Imperial Service Medal because after all this, he actually came back and completed his nursing and he worked for 30 years down on Pete and Wilson Island. He never married. Um, he had a breakdown and ended up in Concord Hospital. Um, he struggled with the drink. And Uncle Bill died. He died at 60. He was 60 in that photo. I like to think, given that I may have passed that mark myself, I'm thinking, how old does he look for 60? And he was, it was only a few months later that he did die. Um, but he's just so proud with his medals on. And that I've got the medal at home, the Imperial Service Medal and the letter from the Queen. And um, there's a photo in the book of when he got awarded the Herald cover, the story, photo of him sitting with the nurse at Lingard when he got his got his medal. So, look, it's a bittersweet story, but it's a story, sadly, that's not unique to my family or to Nick. 
I'm sure you've all got people in the family that served. And when you see what they went through, the other thing I wanted to bring out in this is it's not just the fighting men, all these support services, all these other people that see such trauma and then come back and try to pick up a life. So, yeah, I know it's a depressing story to end on, but I have to say within the book, there, there are there are stories of their training when they come back to Australia and the towns have to close the pubs because they've got no alcohol left and how the terrible thing is they might actually serve have to serve these men wine instead of beer because how terrible would that be? And it's like warm and what will they do? Um, so there's some, there's some good stories, there's some good characters. Um, they get up to a bit of mischief, uh, but generally when the time comes, they do what they have to do and they're so young. The, the, mostly the a lot of the men in the medical units were a bit older um and in the old days because they only started the field ambulance as a service uh Crimean war it really started in the 1850s and um they were originally made up of the band members and the old blokes who couldn't do much else just to be sent out to grab the bodies or the wounded from the from the field and it was developed from there so that's my story and thank you very much for listening and I'm sorry if I've gone over time.